All right, going live in five. Everybody who is not presenting right now, please turn your mics off. We're live. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the last content uh, session of the Petersheim Academic Exposition for 2020. This is the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, Mathematics, Computer Science, and Data Science Student Research Showcase. And our first presenter is, as far as I can tell, not yet here. So we're going to go to our second presentation after a few brief announcements. The first announcement is that one of our department minors, Aishwarya Rai, has won one of the awards for her talk resulting from our core three course on logic limits and Christ to limits to knowledge and Christianity on Muslim anticipation of Western economics during the Islamic Golden Age. She received a $1,000 award to fund her attendance at conferences. And I will now turn it over to Professor Sackerman for a few words. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Normally, this is our Peter Scheim afternoon. We would have our Charlie Frank Memorial Lecture, our Pamu Upsilon induction, and things of that nature. So I just wanted to, uh, building off of what Dr. Marlowe said, I'd like to announce the names of our Pamu Upsilon inductees. Uh, they would be Junior Evan Ganning, who I believe is at least a second generation inductee, Sarah Hutchinson, Brooke Mullen, John Mirzaku, Marie Sokol. Johan Potapara and Wenning Wei. So congratulations to those students. I believe Johan and Wenning are seniors and uh, the others are juniors. In addition, our department uh, was fortunate enough to have two of our students receive the prestigious Claire Booth Luce Mid-Career Fellowships. And those would be Donna D'Alessio and Elizabeth Puskas. And congratulations to them. And finally, uh, one of our rising seniors, he's a junior now, uh, math majors, Sarah Hutchinson, received the Claire Booth Luce Summer Research Fellowship for 2020. Thank you, Dr. Marlowe. All right, so we have a total of six presentations scheduled, one on mathematics, one on data science, one on a senior project that mixes data science and computer science, an overview presentation on our software engineering course, and a report on two team projects by the teams involved. I should mention that if you are a presenter, you should be able, or have been invited as a presenter, you should be able to use your mic to ask questions. Otherwise, you should use the question and answer window, which should be identified on the uh, screen you're seeing by a question mark in a box. And if you type your question, either I will forward it to the team or the team will respond in writing if their session is already over. Is our first presenter here, Christian? Okay, I hope he will be coming soon. And uh, since he is not yet here, I'm going to ask Annalisa Espino to give her presentation on graph theory, after which we'll try again. Okay, thank you. Annalisa, you should uh, share your presentation and open your mic. All right. Hi, everybody. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Awesome. So yep. my name is Annalisa Espino. I'm a junior um, in the Department of Math and Computer Science. I am getting my major in math. Um, for this research project, I was studying adjacency eigenvalues for underlying split multigraphs um, with Dr. Sackerman. So first, some background information on multigraphs. Here I have an example of one. A multigraph is essentially um, when you can split the graph into different subsets. So you can see that from this example. 
Um, and at the top, I've written the notation down for everyone. So IPS stands for ideal proper split graph. C is the number of cones. So off this example, you can see that there are eight cones and a cone is outside of the clique, which is the box. So there's four at the top and four at the bottom. Um, D stands for the degree of each cone. So in our example, the degree is two and the degree means the number of edges exiting the cone. And we have mu, which stands for the multiplicity of edges within the clique. In this example, there is no mu. However, um, if we had a multiplicity of one, um, each node within the clique would connect to each other node one time. And lastly, we have X, which stands for the number of cone nodes to which each clique node is adjacent. So for this example, we have two. So our main research question was if these multigraphs represent satellite and ground station communication. So the satellites would be the cone nodes and the ground station being the clique nodes. Could we find a formula to best represent the number of triangles from the ground station to the satellites? So the number of triangles is really important for um, satellite communication and triangulation. So that's why we were focused on the number of triangles specifically. So here's how we actually did this. First, we looked at the adjacency matrix. So here I have one of the smaller graphs that we studied and numbered all the vertices. And from here, we took the adjacency matrix. So the way you look at an adjacency matrix is for this example, let's say vertex one is connected only to vertex 10, 11, and 12. So if we were to look at the first row, which is the row for vertex one, it's all zeros except for 10, 11, 12, which are ones because it connects to those. And you go all the way down for every vertex. And for this example, you can see the dotted lines represent um, the mu, which is the multiplicity I spoke about. And each vertex in this clique connects to each and every one, one time. So from there, we took our adjacency matrix, which is shown on the left, and we split it into four subsets. So the subset on the right would be the matrix um, for the clique nodes. And we're less concerned with these because we are less concerned with the ground stations communicating with other ground stations. We want to focus solely on the satellites communicating with the ground stations. So our adjacency matrix on the right is for the ground stations in the clique. So to actually find the number of triangles, we took the characteristic polynomial of our matrix. And you see the sub matrix, we took our characteristic polynomial and we looked at the coefficient of X to the six because that gives us twice the number of triangles. And from there, um, we took that number and divided it by two to get the number of triangles within the clique. And those are the number of triangles with ground stations communicating to ground stations. From there, we took the same thing, but with the whole matrix, and we ended up getting 111 triangles. And since we're not concerned with the ground stations communicating to ground stations, we subtracted that number and ended up with 27 triangles, um, and that's satellites communicating to ground stations. So here we have our conjecture, and it's split into five parts looking at how we can find the number of triangles and how we can find the eigenvalues. So we'll look at it each um, section. First, for the number of triangles, um, we plug in the formula. So we take our x's, um, our c naughts, and our mu's, and when we plug it all in, you'll see that we get 27, which is the same number we got when we plugged it in using the adjacency and the characteristic polynomials. So this held true for all the graphs that we looked at. Next, our eigenvalues. So here in the middle, here's the list of all the eigenvalues for our conjecture part two and three, it's really only focused on the eigenvalues in that blue box that I made. So you can see that there are six eigenvalues of zero and six eigenvalues of negative one. And our 
conjectures two and three says that if we use our C naught times X minus one, it'll give us the number of eigenvalues that equal zero and also equal negative mu. So when we plug this in, we get three times three minus one, which gets us six, and that holds true because the multiplicity for these two eigenvalues is six. For the fourth part of our conjecture, it is for the ones in the blue box. It says that there are two eigenvalues for the roots of this polynomial. So on the bottom left, you see the polynomial and we plugged in the numbers, and this is the same polynomial as our factored polynomial quotient of the characteristic polynomial. And from there, we take the use the quadratic formula and we get those two eigenvalues. And for each eigenvalue, there are they have a multiplicity of two, like we said in our conjecture. For the fifth part, we see there is uh, eigenvalues with the multiplicity of one for the roots of this polynomial. We do the same process again, and we end up with that polynomial being the irreducible of our characteristic polynomial, and our eigenvalues are nine and negative one. So in the end, we have this data here showing the number of triangles for all our graphs. Um, and as you can see, it increases. And then when you switch the C value, so let's say IPS 930, the first one, when it switches to 1230, there's a dip in the number of triangles and then it increases again. So you can see that this pattern continues for all the triangles that we looked at. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Annalisa. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I know Christian has been trying to log in. Christian, are you here at this point? I'm here. Can you hear me? New Jersey yes. Space Consortium. Uh, it's, it's a New Jersey Space Consortium grant of Etino University. AT, I don't know what's happening here, but. OK, Christian, can you put your presentation up and uh, put your mic on? Obviously, it's on already. OK. I am up. Can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. OK, we're hearing um, so I'm just going to talk about what happens when data science meets compliance. I'm going to start off and just give a quick overview and try to lay a bit of some groundwork and then we'll kind of get more into what actually um, transpired throughout this project. So what exactly is data science? I know a lot of people hear a lot of things about it. Um, it's a very hot topic in today's uh, day and age, especially given our, our current circumstances. So basically, there's been a massive influx of data and improved ability to handle it, right? We're constantly creating tons of new data, whether it be through your, uh, your smartphone, through your web activity, um, through your Fitbits, if you have it, there's a ton of data. And so we finally have the right uh, the right programs in place to be able to, to actually see what we can get out of there, right? So it realistically is just a blend of various tools, algorithms, and machine learning principles with the goal to discover hidden uh, patterns from raw data. So we're just trying to churn out all these mountains of data and see what kind of insights, what kind of actions we can take from there. Uh, so it's primarily used to make decisions and predictions, making use of predictive casual analytics, prescriptive analytics, and machine learning. And so predictive analytics is basically just your, your model's ability to actually tell what's going to happen next. Right, so you can think about trying to predict if customers will make future payments or not. Then you have your prescriptive analytics, which is more of trying to give a bunch of different recommendations, right? So we have different levers we want to pull given particular uh, scenarios. And machine learning, our artificial intelligence has just more to do with how do we do these things without the need for human interaction. So we can just get all this stuff automated. Um, so compliance, which is kind of the, the big part of where this project comes in, uh, is basically the process of making sure that a company employees follow all laws, regulations, standard, and ethical practices that apply to um, the organization. I think everyone at some point in time has had to deal with uh, compliance in one way, form, or another, whether you had to fill out a, a stack of papers or whatever the case may be. But the goal is just to protect the business from any form of liability or litigation. Nobody wants to be sued. It's not a fun thing. And so this is why um, compliance exists. 
And so the goal is to integrate into all parts of the business, no matter where you are, you are integrating with some kind of compliance or some kind of laws you have to follow. And it should realistically be a seamless interaction. Um, you don't want to have to continue to go back and forth and do a lot to get all this information cleaned out. And so what happens is because we're integrated with all different parts of the, the, the business, you're typically dealing with a very large amount of forms and applications. And that's kind of where our, our use case comes in here. Um, and so the problem is that because of the large amounts of paperwork, it makes it very difficult to sit out what happened that, that needs to be flagged, right? It's very difficult to find the mistakes. And so when you have a delayed discovery of mistakes, you have a delayed um, handling of those mistakes, right? Getting to the right people. And so when there's a delayed handling of mistakes, the company's opened up further and further to litigation and liability. And again, we want to minimize liability and litigation as much as possible. And so what happens is they need a quick way, quick and reliable way to process all that paperwork and flag whatever is incorrect so that we can kind of start moving into corrective action. Um, so expense reports, right, can be filed from non-sanctioned locations. Uh, most people are not covering things like bars and lounges, uh, golf clubs, things of that nature. Uh, payments can be made to non-sanctioned parties. Think about if someone's trying to pay off a government official or something like that, that's obviously a red flag. And then things, simple things like large expenditures, those are also flags. Uh, and so the solution, um, so I worked with uh, one of the, a large healthcare firm, unfortunately, because it is in um, compliance, there's a limit on how much information I can show. Um, but I can walk everyone through kind of what happened there. So one of the, the first things to do is incorporate geolocation data to identify types of locations. So this business was, it's a global corporation. And so they have, um, they do business in China and Italy um, in different parts of Africa and all types of places. And so you need to be able to understand what exactly are we looking at? And even when you think about um, the United States, there's places that you may not have heard of before. You may not understand what those places exactly are. So having to do some feature engineering there and just kind of understand exactly what type of location are we talking about, right? Is this a diner? Is this a restaurant? Is this a factory? How do you identify that? And then we use our natural language processing tools. And so natural language processing is just the ability to take text and things like that and turn it into something that's machine readable and machine understandable. And so through that, we use that to be able to analyze the, the report structure to identify possible inconsistencies. So something, for example, that you might see is that people are filing um, meal expense reports, but the location that they're at is actually some kind of factory, right? Like that's, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up with what the purpose is. So that's something that would automatically be flagged based off of that. Um, and so from there, you would then use some supervised learning techniques to be able to uh, classify and train some models so that the models can then automatically uh, incorporate the data and then spit out whether or not it needs to be flagged. And so again, this is kind of that last step of what we talked about on the first slide as far as getting it integrated into systems so that you don't have to worry about people um, interacting with it. And then lastly, just tune the, the algorithm to make sure that everything works, um, again, very smoothly and automatically. And so I think that's my last slide if there's no questions. Question. Yes. Uh, are you uh, legal compliance? So, are you using the geolocation to determine which laws? Are yes, that's also a part of it. So, the it's a two-parter. The first part being obviously to identify locations themselves but secondly as you said depending on where those locations are there are going to be different um there's going to be different parameters that they have to follow and so that all exists within um, a separate database and so that is also what helps to control the switches as far as flagging what's what thank you very much uh, Christian, I know you had to sign an NDA uh, regarding the data and the problem, but ca could you just talk about uh, the company a little bit, explaining uh, what, what it does, uh, you know, just give a general overview? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that is not, <laughs> I can do that. Um, so the, the company was BD, um, Beck and Dickinson. If you're not familiar with them, you've probably interacted with their product at some point in time. They are one of the largest um, producers in the, the medical uh, supply and healthcare space. So essentially everything from medical syringes to masks, I think they even have some ventilators that they do. Um, so if you've ever been to a doctor's office, um, or a hospital at some place, you've probably interacted with them. And so this 
particular uh, project housed, you have, <laughs> I'm sure, you, as you can imagine, deals with a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different projects. And there's a lot of obviously rules and regulations that have to um, be followed when you're talking about things like medical grade equipment. And so that's another part of why it's so super important to um, for them to be able to crack down on things as quickly as possible because you, you don't want to be months out finding out that your new batch of needles is not um, does not comply with what you need what you need to be complied with um, or things are, aren't as they seem and then having to recall that or having to have those conversations further down the line um, especially when it comes to things again that are so imperative to health. Okay. Uh, Christian, I've got questions on the food. One asks if you have a design or a demo that you can make public. Mm -hmm. The uh -huh. other asks if uh, you mentioned ethical practices, but what about broader of the organization? But what about broader ethical considerations that may not be part of organizational rules? social ethics or whatever are those addressed in any way are you raising flags or oh, for the, the the making the um model public i would have to just confirm on what i can and cannot do um with bd i just want to make sure i don't um, cross any lines but as far as long as they're okay with it then i'm absolutely fine with that um, i could put it up maybe on github or something and we can find a way to get that circulated uh, as far as other ethical um, values that we're looking at, there isn't much outside of what the, so the, obviously there is the overarching um, legal implications from the different countries and, and states and areas that we have to interact with. And then there is the BD um, ethics and qualities that are stacked on top of that. Um, you have to be, when we talk about social ethics, um, it depends on what we're talking about via social ethics. If we're talking about, are we making sure that things are like pricing for certain things or if we're making sure that things are ethically sourced or whatever, a lot of that stuff will fall under and is already taken care of a lot of the rules and regulations, um, whether it be on the, the national state or the, um, the company level, a lot of those things are taken care of. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it is a very extensive, um, packet of information that you have to go through to, to go through read all of the um, regulations I had to familiarize familiarize myself with it and it was a very heavy read I will be honest um, so a lot of stuff is taken care of if there's a specific uh, question around a specific ethical practice we could probably discuss that um, but a lot of stuff is already covered okay thank you rest if I'm you'll have to deal with it uh, I should also mention before I do that obviously there are going to be some national and regional and other cultural issues that come into social ethics as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question is what tools did you use for your natural language processing? Um, so I use for, for this I used um, Jupyter Notebook and I specifically um, in the Python library was text blob. Um, a lot of people use uh, NLT key, the natural language toolkit. It's probably something that you hear float around if you start exploring the space. Um, the text blob is actually a bit more flexible in what you're able to do, um, especially with some of the, the uh, sentence decomposition. And it's actually, a, the syntax is fairly simpler as well. Okay, well, thank you. Presentation. Josh, you're up next. Uh, this is, uh, Josh Chappelle will be talking about a senior project that he worked with with me and with Dr. Catherine Herbert from Montclair State University. And he will describe the dimensions of that project, which actually overlaps with the software engineering uh, project this year that we'll describe in our next presentation. OK, Josh, it's to you now. Hi, my name is Josh Chappelle. I'm a senior uh, computer science major at Seton Hall University, and today we're going to be talking about autism spectrum disorder and um, wearable devices. Um, so just to give an overview, um, this senior project consisted of three parts, a survey paper, a team project that you will see in a later uh, session, and then an Android application that I will be showing off a little bit later. Um, so first, the paper, what is it and why are we doing this? Um, 
Currently, there's no comprehensive recent study that uh, uh, encompasses both uh, technology focus and addressing wearable devices with uh, data science. Um, and we hope to eventually submit this to a journal or a conference. Um, the sections of the paper include an introduction, um, wearable and recent and related technologies, where we talk about recent discoveries that have um, and recent uh, research that has been done in wearable devices related specifically to um, autism spectrum disorder. We then go into medical therapy uh, practices that are currently used in autism spectrum disorder. Um, then we talk a little bit about data science and statistical analysis that happens again uh, with ASD. Um, then we go and talk about um, some advice and data sets, meaning you know um, what organizations are currently out there to help people who have um, autism spectrum disorder, what organizations are out there to help their caregivers, um, as well as what data sets are available to researchers out there that would like to do more research in this field. Um, we also then talk about earlier summaries and comparisons where we compare some, um, uh, some real um, survey studies that happened in the past that cover one or more of the sections above, and then we try to tie it all together um, and show how all these different fields are related. And then we also brush on ethical issues that occur with uh, much of the research that currently goes on, especially with wearable devices. Um, and then we uh, conclude with our conclusion and future work. Um, so the main issue is that one of 54 Americans currently in America are born with autism spectrum disorder. Um, of these people, many of them find themselves in scenarios where they can be overwhelmed and they're unable to control their bodies or emotions. This can lead to uh, the caregivers being overwhelmed, which can lead to neglect and abusive behavior. Um, it's important to note though that both the neglect and abusive behavior isn't, um, is usually just the side effect. They're not trying, the caregivers aren't trying to do that, but they're not informed or, um, and they're uneducated in these steps that are needed to uh, calm uh, an individual ASD down. So our proposal is to build a system that can detect in real time if an individual with uh, autism spectrum disorder is being overwhelmed. And if they are, we would like to relay that information to their uh, parent and caregiver, caregiver so they can take the necessary precautions to calm them down. We want to be able to detect the error, the issue before it occurs, which will allow the caregiver to have some extra time needed uh, before the situation escalates. Um, and this system that we're building has four major parts. One is a wearable device that monitors vital signs such as location, um, also monitors uh, motion, and also provides um, an attention button where uh, it, the individual um, with ASD can um, like hit a button on their device so that they can say like, hey, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Like you need to either help me get out of this room or, you know, help me, um, you know, calm down the situation. Um, the second part is a web server and a database to store the resulting information in. Um, and the reason we need that is for the next point where we're going to use a machine learning algorithm to determine if there is a normality. And then if there is a normality, um, we will alert the user uh, through a mobile uh, web application. Um, however, there are some issues currently with our prototype, and that is that we are limited to only heart rate monitoring since we are using Fibbit as our wearable device. And we are also um, limited to the data that the Fitbit API uh, allows us. So this is an overview of how the application would look. Um, if you look in the top left corner, um, the Fitbit device, uh, the way it works is it sends heart rate data to the Fitbit API server. And what we would do is we would have our own RESTful API server that also hosts an ML algorithm on it. And what we would do is we would um, authorize to the Fitbit API server using O authentication. We would collect data from their API, feed it into our database, and then the ML algorithm would work off of our database to determine um, if there's an abnormality. And if so, it would alert the caregiver on the mobile application. Um, and then, as I said earlier, there are some issues that still need to be addressed with this prototype, especially when it comes to we have to be FERPA and HIPAA compliant. Uh, the data needs to be stored behind multiple layers of security because we are talking about some very sensitive data that we are trying to um, store into our database. Um, and again, we are limited by the current technology and um, current technology that is currently out there that is more advanced than the Fitbit, um, it's not very comfortable or very socially acceptable. And that is, um, as we are going through a lot of research papers, um, a lot of concluding remarks were that like these devices that, that are out there, um, 
that offer more capabilities are too bulky or they, they don't look normal and the people don't want to wear them. Um, so, you know, one of the things to strive for would be to make a device that looks sort of modern um, and up to date. And of course, there are the ethics that are involved with uh, this too. Um, you know, we are trying to house information and vital signs and stuff like that. But you know, how can we get there? Um, we need to make sure that they're comfortable with that. They understand exactly what they're signing up for, uh, et cetera. So unfortunately, um, I can't run the um, the device uh, live just because my computer um, is too slow. So it doesn't. Um, it's not going to allow me to run the emulator while also presenting. Um, but this is a picture of what the home screen would look like. It's again, it's a current, it's an early prototype. Um, you'd be able to um, add a user, um, and by adding a user, you'd be able to register your Fitbit with um, our server application, um, so that we could start scraping data from the uh, Fitbit API. So when you would click Add, you'd go to this login screen for the authentication, and once you authenticate, we would be then able to grab some of your data. Um, and this is an example of what a data set might look like. We have your user, your user ID, and then for each day you have four data sets. Um, one is the um, fat burn, the cardio, the peak, and the out of range. Um, and all these data sets is currently what we're limited to. Um, again, we would that is one of the limitations of the APIs. We can't get super, super precise data, unfortunately. Um, and I would just like to acknowledge um, uh, Professor Chang of High Step Technologies, Father Joseph Flaherty, uh, John Sackerman, and uh, the Mathematics and Computer Science Department for um, all their help. Thank you. Okay, before going on to questions, I should say that uh, Josh and Dr. Herbert and I intend to carry this project further even after he graduates. And it's possible we might even start looking for some foundation funding to develop this. At least I'd like to hope so. Uh, yes, any other definitely. questions or comments? Again, if you're just an attendee, you can ask your questions or make your comments through the uh, conversation, the comment window. Sorry, the Q&A window, which is a little box with a question mark. If you have, if they're coming in right now, I can relay them to Josh. If they come in later, he will look at those and respond. Anybody? Okay, well, thank you again, Josh. And yes, now, I'm going to, okay, anybody going to ask? Uh, Professor Chang to turn his mic on and ask Professor Marlowe to put up his presentation. OK, quickly. I think we can manage to do that. OK, my mic is on. Okay. Excellent. So this is sort of a prelim to the next two presentations. We had a software engineering course that ran for a full year. And this was the full year C, uh, project. There were five groups. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the other three groups did. But uh, and we're going to see why we chose this project. So what happens? What is a recommender system? I think you've all seen them. Everybody tends to get these. We're recommending these news stories for you. We're rec uh, recommend Amazon is going to recommend these products for you. Somebody's going to say, hey, you might be interested in these articles. They use your past articles that you're interested in or anything else. They may have some records of where you've gone. They may have some records of what you have bought and they're going to use those. We'll make use of your user history preferences again. Anyone on social media, most people on the internet have seen these. And there are some examples here. I won't go through all of them. You can read through them as fast as I can. And if you've been involved in any of these, you will have seen them. OK, what could be added? Why isn't this enough? Well, first, we could use some more specialized recommender systems, and that's what these five topics are going to deal with. 
we'd also like to give the user a little more control over what they receive. Ideally, and this is probably in the future for most of these projects, to allow some Boolean search to say, give me articles on software engineering, but not dealing with agile programs, agile methods. Provide some clustering search options that say, OK, you're interested in this. Here are some interesting subtopics. Allow you to refine your selection, tailor your delivery. So you could say, give them to me once a day or give them to me only when we log on. Or here's what I think is most important. Put these at the front. And limit some repeated delivery so you don't see things quite as often. But you do see things that are urgent or critical. Professor Chang, any comments at this point? Uh, none so far. OK. Uh, you want to take the next slide? Um, no, that's fine. You can continue. I think it's fine. OK, so why are we doing this? It's I've taught software engineering for maybe 20 years and about the last 10 years using something along the line of the agile development scheme we've been looking for. And it's always been difficult to find a good project. So we tried to come up with a decent project here and we said uh, that this sounds good. It gives students experience in a fairly large, at least by comparison to anything they've done to date. Project real world level web and mobile development. The students have to interact and we'll see this in the talks with various sources on the web, databases, inventories. They have to use data science tools or homemade, home built systems to select the articles to push and to, to select how they encode user information and they need to maintain databases. So these are all the pieces that they need. They have to look at recommendations. They had to go out and develop a business plan and a product vision and look at what they wanted to provide. It developed technical skills. Okay, this is a little bit repetitive, but they were looking at all of these things and at the end you can see a number of software engineering challenges that actually got addressed or software engineering tools that they actually used. I should also probably add threading and distributed programming because I know almost everybody wound up doing something like that simply because the complexity and the time demands of actually running this thing is very in, are very intensive. It also helps the students develop soft skills that are going to be very, very attractive to the market. Work on a large project, develop a constructive coding style, really push on communication. It was a big deal both inside the individual teams and across teams. There's a huge emphasis. Everybody wants to hire people who have good teamwork and who are able to switch leadership depending on what task they're dealing with or who has expertise. Definitely has helped people refine. I've listened to some of these talks, their critical on thinking, their analysis, and their ability to change what they're doing based on how things are working or based on recommendations or what the other teams have been doing. And to consider and address the social, legal, ethical issues, which came up again in almost every project. I don't say everything has been addressed all the way in everybody's project. But that's the way it goes. So this was a year long project. In the first semester, I took the lead, Professor Marlowe, with Professor Chang occasionally coming in and helping, and Om Hashmi from Agile Brains Consulting, who's listening in, coming in for a very well received guest presentation, getting a conceptual understanding of what was going on, outlining what they wanted to do understanding the requirements, understanding user interfaces, and finishing the semester with an individual initial prototype. 
Professor Chang, maybe you want to talk about the second term. Sure. Uh, so then uh, from the deliverables in the first semester, the actual uh, requirements and in initial prototype, the goal in the second semester was, OK, introduce the students to how do you actually go from conceptually your ideas of a product to gathering your requirements to actually delivering, <laughs> building a product and and exposing the students to real world development, incremental iterative development, the various roles that uh, individuals play on the team, uh, product development team, and you know how you may move from your initial assumptions to see how your initial assumptions may drastically change or your requirements change as you gain more understanding. And uh, uh, those were some of the main things that we, we kind of addressed and exposed the students to over the semester. And throughout Professor Chang, and I've heard him in a couple of the classes, was providing students with case histories, anecdotes, advice based on his own professional work in his company and other things that he's heard of. And I really know that the students have benefited an enormous amount from that. So we wound up with five projects. I must say uh, the, win the PowerPoint design recommender did a wonderful job with this slide. We're going to go through very briefly a few slides on the first three groups and the last two groups will present in opposite order with what they've done as separate presentations. So uh, Professor Chang, Garrett, do you want to take over any of this? Would you like to do discussing these? I can do the cybersecurity in the. Uh, they, that one's done. They're doing it their own. OK. All right, so the. Every project is essentially um, if you can go to the next slide. OK, so essentially it's a tool that allows uh, users to search for uh, music uh, based on topics that they may identify with our sounds or that may sound similar to music they enjoy hearing or listening to. And uh, the the business goal of the the product itself is to give artists exposure to a larger audience uh, for their music. Um, folks that may not have known that and this artist existed or or had music that would necessarily uh, they would be interested in. the The goal of the product was to expo give the artist exposure to these these folks. So an overview of the project. Uh, this project was uh, essentially a platform where artists could come. They would upload their music, whether in songs or instrumental. Uh, the users would be able to create accounts in order to listen to music as well as add uh, music to their library and get recommendations on similar music based on their taste. Uh, it would incorporate profiles for users, artists, and advertisers. Uh, users can search for songs uh, about something related to the music they may like uh, and, and or even it's pretty interesting is even the frequency of the music that uh, they would listen to. Uh, the technology, I won't go too much into the, the technology stack uh, as it may be unfamiliar to folks listening, but the technology itself is based on a uh, fairly popular framework from Microsoft um, ASP.NET Core. It's called uh, Razor Pages Entity Framework and, and the uh, analytics portion of it, uh, machine learning portion of it uses a product from originating out of Google known as TensorFlow. Okay. Uh, the overall architecture for the project, the students tried to build uh, what's, there are several approaches uh, that uh, we introduced the students to throughout the semester and well, in the early part of the semester in terms of approaches to building uh, software, modern software architectures. And each team uh, picked a specific architecture and then uh, uh, attempted to build their software based on that architecture. And uh, for this project, uh, they chose what's called uh, microservice architectures, which is fairly, fairly new type of architecture that you're starting to see a lot of buzzwords around, but a lot of organizations are starting to embrace how to specifically build their services based on the microservice architecture. So for students, this is a great exposure. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, so the next project was a recommendation system for college articles. And basically the team felt that people keep getting them bombarded by advertisements from colleges, but they would like to have some more objective information on colleges. So students and families could look and decide what college they might want to apply to. And for that matter, aspiring or current professors could look and see what colleges they might want to go to. Because when you're looking for a job, you don't want to apply to something that's completely out of line with your own talents or interests. And again, I can ask Professor Chang to comment on this. Sure, uh, so the overall architecture uh, was uh, the front end of the application, the, the user interface uh, was uh, built in a popular uh, framework out of uh, Facebook known as React. And uh, interesting enough is that, uh, you know, one of the things we introduced the students to were uh, modern authentication systems. We went over, Seton Hall, for example, uses Okta. Many organizations actually use Okta. And uh, we introduced uh, the students to Okta and OAuth and how that process works. And actually a couple of projects, actually a couple of the students' projects implemented uh, uh, Okta for their authentication system. Um, the back end is based on a Python framework for building uh, web APIs uh, known as Flask. And the underlying database uh, was MongoDB, which is a popular NoSQL database uh, outside of your traditional relational database realm. Okay. So this is more or less the current status, and uh, undoubtedly this will continue again as a project. And students comment that they've learned how to work on a fairly large project how to move from an idea first semester through a prototype into a working application, and again, how to take a dynamic leadership role, a role-based leadership within teams. The third project we'd like to look at, it was a gaming project, this project for gamers to recommend new video games based on the games they've liked, on the games they've looked for, on the genre of the games. Maybe people might like civil war games or war games in general or naval battles or word searches or whatever. And you can look for things that are similar to what you like or you could even try out something new using this tool. Again, uh, Professor Chang, anything to say about this one? Uh, so similar, uh, this uh, development stack was built on Python, but this team took a different approach, whereas the front end on the uh, the other project, the previous project was built on React. This team built the front end on just traditional HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and uh, the entire development stack or framework used was uh, called Django, which is a very popular uh, Python framework that came out of the newspaper industry, actually. And uh, for their backend database, they chose uh, SQLite, which is a sort of relational database, not traditionally used when you're building web applications, but for the case of this, this project was is fine for a student project. And uh, what I th what I thought was interesting is that you know the we kind of learned, and the students themselves learned that in the end you could really choose any development framework that. Uh, you like. It's really what the, your choice should not necessarily be based on a religious work because folks tend to get religious about their technology choices. And the based on what each student chose, you can see that you can really build and deliver any product in any framework. It's, your choice should be based on what the team is comfortable with and is able to work uh, effectively with. Okay, so there's some comments. There is a quick preview of in one corner their database, in another corner their, uh, in the upper right is their search tool, and in the bottom is their uh, another part of their search tool and a part of their user interface. Again, what they've learned 
they're focusing more on what they've learned technically than what they've learned in terms of process, but again, some very valuable lessons to take from there. As conclusion, we have five extraordinarily different projects. You'll see still more differences in the next two. With different implementation decisions and emphases, every group did substantial work. Everything has resulted in the core of a useful product. Problem several, at least two, and maybe all of these can be made into actual marketable projects. Building out trying to get an enterprise to fund them, or by going in the case of the autism project to a foundation. Everybody worked extraordinarily hard. I think everybody learned valuable intellectual, interpersonal, and can't see that last word, lessons, as well as professional and technical skills. And every one of them will be able to use it as part of their student portfolio. Okay. All right. Anybody, any questions? Any comments? Really impressive set of projects. Uh, I've been teaching software engineering for a long time and looking at the selection and the, the number of tools and environments that have been tried. It's really impressive. Uh, how big how big are the teams or were the teams? Uh, and did they uh, work uh, as agile teams uh, going through the ceremonies? Did they build product backlogs and do retrospectives? Or every team was also uh, at liberty to choose the, the way they operate, the way of working? Okay, so each team was around four. Uh, I believe some teams may have had five individuals. And we introduced the, uh, the concept of agile development Obviously, you know, you know, given that you know, a student project in the course of a semester with other classes, it's kind of difficult to really practice true agile, where you're breaking things down into sprints and delivering yes. software in uh, two-week cycles, for example. But the you know, it was some great things came out of this, in that the I th one team, for example, you know, all of the teams use GitHub for version control, and and uh, folks even implemented their own continuous integration and continuous deployment uh, um, pipelines for building in and deploying their software. And one team went as far as actually having a project management tool using GitHub as a project management tool where they would track tasks on a, a, a board and actually have their their task in the board, similar to what you would do in a traditional agile development uh, project. Very nice, thank you. OK, I should also mention that uh, the teams did have regular meetings with basically, you know, depending on how you think of Professor Chang, either their technical manager or their sprint manager or their customer and he took on all three roles at various times right good point okay so i think what we'll see next is going to be the project from the autism spectrum disorder uh, article recommender group john if you want to put that uh, powerpoint up and they're going to be a powerpoint in the demo and then we will uh, after okay and the group can then comment according to whoever is scheduled to talk all right hi everybody how's everyone doing today everyone can hear me hopefully um yeah yep. so yes. um my name is Sachin Mahashabde, and I'm here with this with our team uh, to talk about um, Autism Searches, which is a modern search engine for ASD-related topics. And before we get into more detail about the product itself, let's just introduce the team. So at the top of the team, we've got uh, Josh Chappelle, who is our project lead and head developer. Hello. Uh, we've got John um, so Barelli, who is a full-stack developer on the team. Hello. Uh, of course, uh, myself, Sachin, um, I was a back-end developer and a machine learning uh, developer on the team. And last but not least, we have Jeremy Suero, who worked in the logo creation, database engineering and design, and also worked on the user implement, uh, the user interface design. Hello. So um, just to give a quick overview of what the application was like, um, it's, it's a recommendation system for ASD-related articles, and it's a single-page application. 
Uh, the idea here was to enrich the public's knowledge about autism, and we hope to enhance the ability for researchers in the field to access other articles that are scholarly about um, ASD. So the technical stack we used uh, was Python mainly for the machine learning. The slide, um, sorry. Uh. All right, so the architecture we decided to use for our project was the layered architecture. We broke our project into four main layers being the control layer, the business layer, the data access layer, and the common layer. So our controller layer contains our endpoints for our RESTful API, and our business layer contains our business logic for the, pro uh, for the project. More specifically, this layer houses the services for each of our controllers for this project, and all, uh, it also has all the errors for the controllers as well as the services, and the machine learning, will, which Sash will go into later. Our data access layer houses our ORM for the project. This is split into two main folders, being model domain and repository. The model domain folder contains our database table models, and the repository folder contains the repository interfaces, which are mapped to data access objects. And in our common layer, we have all the code that is used between all of the previous layers mentioned, as well as our CSV reader and our fetcher, which will fetch articles and write them to SQL scripts for MySQL and for the CSV. Um, we decided to loosely couple our layers, which allows us to easily update our layers, easily swap them or create brand new layers with ease of use. Um, and we use this layered approach because it is scalable to an extent and it's really easy to read the project and its structure when we're coding. Uh, so like I said, uh, this is the, we used uh, the following technical stack. Uh, Python was more for machine learning. Um, uh, we used uh, Java with Spring MVC for our back end. Um, JavaScript, ReactJS for our front with uh, JS and CSS also. Um, our backend uh, server was built in Java using uh, Spring uh, MVC. Um, each service within our business layer extends an interface, uh, which allows scalability and also allowed us to add new layers and service uh, easily. Uh, we used aspect-oriented programming to link all the layers and use uh, the Jackson framework for serialization and deserialization of JSON files. Um, also in our application, uh, we uh, practiced object-oriented programming, um, favoring composition over inheritance whenever possible. And finally, uh, here are some of the design patterns we followed, which include uh, adapter and uh, factory pattern. Um, for the machine learning, which is also on the back end, uh, we use a periodically updating Python script. Uh, the data is pulled from these APIs, uh, which give us our articles, and then we use Python. And we use a simple uh, TF-IDF vectorization with cosine scoring uh, to generate recommendations based on the similarities between uh, the different articles. Uh, the results of those recommendations are then returned back to the uh, back end, and then we display those results to the user. Um, so we took a test-driven development approach um, as one of our core design principles. Um, so each layer, um, we specifically tested each layer using mocking and stubbing. Um, for those who aren't familiar with mocking, it's basically just a dummy object that we inject into um, that we inject into uh, an interface, um, and then it basically, um, when we call that interface, instead of so for instance, if we were calling the database and we wanted to make sure that we're getting information from the database, instead of having to rely on the data that's in the database, um, we would just inject a mock into that, into, that, um, into that function call and it would return the, um, the mocked object instead. So this allows us to be able to substitute layers in and out easily and still have, not have to worry about rewriting our tests uh, every single time. So I move on to the application demo. John, that's you. Yep. So this is uh, our uh, login page. And before I start the login process, uh, we also have a, an About Us page with a nice quote. Um, explains about our mission. And we have our GitHub um, information. So uh, in our home page, um, as you can see, you have a username password. Uh, so first, we will want to create an account. So once you click it, it takes you to this page. In this page, you can uh, choose any image. Uh, we chose to uh, use a 
languages. Yeah, yeah, programming yeah. Languages, yeah. Um, so Java. Um, you can choose a uh, username, uh, first name, last name. On the names out, password. In the future, or right now, uh, you get after you create an account, you get uh, an option to choose from which news sources you want to get your articles from. So you just uh, choose a couple uh, that interest you, and then after you click create account, uh, your account is created. Now you can log in using your username. And password in the future, we actually already implemented the Okta authorization. We just haven't it up yet, so that's coming. So after you sign in, um, you are in the home page uh, where you see your username and picture on top. And the first thing you see is the recommend articles. Now these articles uh, are uh, hardcore embedded, and they are like according to the uh, sources you chose while um, signing up. And uh, you can see there's a plus here. So let's say you you want to similar find similar articles to this um, article. You would click here, and then uh, on the bottom, the most similar article from all our database is uh, is shown. And you could do this for every article, and and that way slowly accumulate articles that you like. And uh, in the future, you could uh, you'll be able to save them. And uh, also here you can see the title, the author, and if you click on more information, um, this tab uh, pops out, and in the future we'll have even a link to the actual article. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, in the nav bar at top, uh, there's the log out button. Um, there's the hamburger, which allows you to skip uh, between pages. So if you go to the start topics, here will be the articles that you liked and stored. And these are the categories you chose uh, in the beginning. You will be able to add, but it's not working currently. You can also, you, only the delete uh, function works currently. So you have to unstar these and then click delete and then it updates. Um, like I said, here you have the articles you liked. Um, you can also edit your profile, um, change a picture. change a picture, for instance, uh, update your username, all that once you're done updating information. And uh, it already has one information. Perfect. Um, yep. Anyone want to add? Yeah, so now if you logged out and you tried to log in with his original, it would be it wouldn't work. Uh, furthermore, that the search implementation will be added um, very shortly. Um, where you'll be able to search and then the recommendations will come in based on the search um, parameters given by the user and um, weighted the results will be weighted based on the uh, preferred sources and topics that the user picks along with articles that they've chosen in the past. Um, we do have some concluding remarks. Um, I guess I could show my screen um, one last time for that. OK, so for our concluding remarks, um, one thing we noticed is that um, so Java it gave us the ability to really fully realize this layered approach. Um, however, uh, as we went on throughout the semesters and, and thinking about it, um, we didn't really use the JVM to its like full potential and its full power. Um, and in, in the end, um, while Java was very um, um, useful for us and, and it's not, not nothing wrong with using Java for, for a project like this, uh, we think that because other languages excel at I.O. bound tasks, it could have provided us other options that would have been uh, quicker for certain things like uh, pulling from APIs and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, that would be all. Any questions from anyone? I have uh, two questions actually. These were to us on our presentation, but one of them definitely applies to you. And the first one was, uh, are we going to do any enhancements on this? And I think first, each of the groups is looking to finish their project and they will look much better. And second, for those who are prospective computer science students or freshmen or sophomores, Professor Chang and I will be teaching this course again in a year and a half. Plug, plug, plug. 
and we'll probably be doing the same project and we'll be discussing with uh, um, Hashmi and uh, Professor Karova and Professor Herbert some additional enhancements. So anybody who is with us will see a even better project, I hope, in two years. It's the other one and the groups. Uh, I'd like to ask this group to respond and then the cybersecurity group can respond after their talk is how did you wind up prioritizing your requirements? Um, um, so you can you can take it. OK, um, so basically we sat down and, and first um, actually sort of developed the layouts, uh, um, actually developed out the UI layouts and thought exactly what the user was going to want. And we programmed um, around what we believed that the user would find useful. And um, our layout way, uh, our entire implementation is focused around um, the user would but and okay. also we had an entire semester to really get it embedded correctly. So we asks how uh, you have any sense of how you could have used more of the potential of the JPM. Yeah, I mean this the uh, JP the JVM is best at CPU bound tasks. Um, we really aren't using any of those. Um, so there's no really need. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with using the JVM. It, it's it's a great uh, virtual machine. Um, but like I guess if it would just be if we if we had used more CPU bound tasks, more heavy threading stuff like that. But we don't we don't use any of that. So yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Any last questions, guys? Anybody? Okay. So we move on to our last group, which is. Uh, the cybersecurity project, and I think uh, yep. Burke, we're doing the project from here. Just wanted yeah, to thank so, everyone uh, for listening, real quick. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah, Burke, you can go ahead and play a video. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to our project display at the Peter Scheim Exposition. Uh, this is our software engineering one and two project for professors Marlow and Chang. Uh, the name of our project has changed slightly since we submitted the abstract, so you'll see that in the paper, but it's changed actually now. Uh, our project is now called searchbreaches.me. Um, we just happened to find this very fitting URL available. Uh, so now on to searchbreaches.me by AJ Shah, Herschel Patel, myself, and Eric Gargiulo. A uh, little bit about our project. Uh, so basically, the goal of our project is to connect individuals to pertinent data related to cybersecurity and breaches. Uh, we wanted to provide our users with information that's secure, up to date, and accurate with an easy to use interface using our web application that you'll see uh, in the demo, and then utilize a self developed score based ma uh, matrix recommendation system that we're going to talk about in the slides, and then you'll also see that in the demo. Uh, some more information, we used Google's Golang programming language, so all of the back end um, uh, coding is all done using the Golang programming language. Uh, we projected uh, the project and hosted it using the Amazon Web Services Cloud. Uh, we happened to get ourselves a few student accounts that allowed us to do this, and we uh, lastly and most importantly have the recommendation system design that was built in-house and was inspired by the Netflix's uh, content-based recommendation algorithm. Uh, the last important thing that I want to mention is we use the Echo Framework for web page generation, which again you'll see in the demo. So this is where we got our data breaches from. We got it from Wikipedia's page on list of data breaches. So this lists like the top uh, biggest breaches in the last century. We use the third party service called Have I Been Pwned, which uh, alerts users on whether they've been affected by a data breach or not, and then lists which data breach they've been affected by. And the third data source that we used was a Kaggle data set. So this is our recommendation system. So from every breach that we extract from the data sources that I listed before, 
they come with a certain amount of attributes, such as like the state where the data breach happened, the, the name of the company that was affected, the type of breach, the industry, and a lot more attributes. So for each one of those breaches, we assign a unique number ID. And for each of the attributes that we have, we assign a certain score for if the breaches are related or not. And we develop this score by ourselves by what we thought was more of a priority. So in this example, we had Equifax, which had a unique ID of uh, 68, and we're comparing that with the Capital One data breach, which we assign a unique ID of 419. And as we could see, they have the same type of breach, which is uh, a web application flaw, and they're from the same industry, which is finance. So we calculate the score of how uh, Capital One uh, relates to Equifax's breach, and we calculate its score to be 45. We load these scores into 68's tree map. It holds IDs with corresponding scores, which are sorted high to low. If IDs have the same score, they're dynamically rotated out. We populate 68's tree map with breaches that have matching attributes. Tree map is sorted by score, with the highest scores being returned as recommendations. Each recommended breach is represented by its ID and displayed on site as a similar breach to the one that is selected. So lastly, uh, we're going to go through this demo now. Uh, everyone can visit this web page. It's actually uh, hosted live, uh, but you can either uh, you know watch along as we go through the site or feel free to look at it yourself and um, play around. OK, so when you log or when you search up the searchbreaches.me web page, it'll prompt you to log in uh, as the first thing. For this demonstration, we're actually going to go ahead and um, create an account. So if you hit the button on the bottom where it says don't have an account, uh, you can set one up. So we'll input a username, Chang101, and then we'll create a password uh, and confirm the password. Uh, for reference, if the you know there's a password mismatch, it'll return an error saying um, the passwords do not match. Uh, so we'll go ahead and register. Uh, so now it says successful registration. We can go in and log in. Once we hit log in, now you'll see that we're actually at the uh, search engine portion of the website. Now you can't actually uh, see this uh, if you don't, you know, have yourself logged in. So if you don't have an account, you got to register and make one. Um, the important part about this is if you try to visit any other part of the website before logging in, it'll route you back to the login page. Uh, so now on this uh, search engine portion of the website, you can see that we have two main options. Uh, we have the option to search a breach and then also look at some popularly searched terms. Um, so for example, let's click a popularly searched term. Uh, say we click university. Uh, you'll see that the page uh, that comes up is now a listing of all of the related university uh, or, or all of the related breaches to the term university that was searched through our database. Um, so if you can, if you uh, if you scroll all the way down and up, you'll see that we have all of these related breaches. Gives a clickable link to their name, and then it also gives the summary if a summary is available. Um, so now we can go back to the home page and take a look at the actual uh, search. So you can do that by hitting the search breaches me. That always take you back to the home page. Um, so let's try searching something in the search bar. Um, so now we can actually search for a breach in the search bar. So we could search for Equifax. So as you can see, it auto filled the breach because it's pulling from our data set and it's able to dynamically pull whatever is relevant by auto completing and predicting our search. So let's click on Equifax. And when we click on Equifax, we could see its actual breach page. And on the breach page, we could see all of its attributes that might be relevant to the breach. So if you scroll down, you could see all the breaches that are actually related to that breach, like in our example. So we could see that JP Morgan's uh, data breach and Bank of America's data breach are very similar to Equifax's. And we also have uh, a button where a user can download this PDF. 
So the PDF version can be downloaded, it can be used as PDF, just has all of the data you saw before in one consolidated place. Now back at the home screen, for any user, we can click this button to change your password. So if I input the password and then a new password, it will be updated in the database. And then we can log in with Chang one two or one zero one and the password, which I've just changed and we log in as normal. Now, here's a little bit about us. Uh, everything you see here was uh, built 100% by all three of us. And we couldn't have done it without the help of our software engineering professors, Professor Marlowe and Professor Chang. Uh, yep, just want to say a big thank you to them and thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, if you have any questions, um, we will be available now to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so that was a pre-recorded video, but uh, we actually have a few more, you know, small things to add uh, based on some of the questions that were asked. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. So this is the actual website, as you saw in the video. A um, few things to, that we wanted to touch on. Um, uh, Professor Chang mentioned it earlier. Uh, we used uh, the Agile method personally for our group, uh, myself, Eric, and AJ. Uh, we went through and we re, uh, you know, we implemented a dashboard with cards with a card system for in progress. Um, currently working, blockers, et cetera, uh, to track, you know, the progress of our project. We also use the uh, GitHub CICD tools uh, as a way to begin, you know, uh, continual testing of our work as we were going through it. Um, and then uh, I did, we didn't go super in depth on what each one of us did, but it actually says it on the about page for us right here. Um, so uh, myself, Herschel, I did a lot of the front end work. AJ was doing most of the back end development and Eric was doing, uh, you know, a lot of API management as well as the testing, uh, which we all worked on together. Um, one other thing to know, our uh, source code, uh, we haven't actually made it public yet. Uh, we're planning to soon, but when you click on this link, if you do, because this website's active, you can go make an account. Um, uh, this will lead to a 404 page as of right now. So just keep that in mind. Eventually down the road, we're going to make it public once we uh, finish up anything, you know, everything. Um, but now open to any questions. I have two questions from the Q&A. Okay. And they're both related and they have two parts. One is, who is this intended for? Uh, I guess I, you yeah, want me to answer? Go yeah, go for it, go for it. Okay. So, uh, this is mainly meant for uh, universities and academic institutions and like cybersecurity companies that need historic breach data to use towards their own research and making their own sort of security products like for antiviruses and uh, uh, firewall protection. Very good. And the second question, which I got twice again, is uh, what made you choose Golang? Uh, I can take this one. So we chose Golang for a few reasons. Um, first of all, with a database that we want to be scalable, um, we need to populate it concurrently. Otherwise, the speed is just not going to be feasible. So we have implemented concurrency, and Golang was incredible for that. It's super straightforward to use concurrency with Go routines. Um, also, it's semi-object oriented, mainly functional. It, it made it very familiar, but really effective for this purpose. Yeah, another thing I would just add on was uh, Golang came with garbage collection, so we didn't really have to worry too much about memory management with our project. For the record, for those who don't know it, Go, Go functions are going to be uh, what's also called futures 
It will create a small thread that will implement, will execute that function and then return the result while the rest of the program is going on. Yeah, that was yep. uh, super, super helpful. OK, any other questions, any comments? OK, guys, I think you can end your presentation. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Okay. Excellent. Thank present. you. And I think that uh, Professor Chang and I would like to thank all five of the teams, especially the two who presented today for absolutely marvelous work all year. Uh, really, this was something. This was a real experience. Thank you. Well, we'd like to thank you guys both for your invaluable help throughout both semesters. It was like such, such an important tool for us to have. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, anybody else need want to comment on anything about the wrap up or anything? Because I think we're about done. I just want to say that it's really impressive and if you haven't packaged this as a uh, publication, um, you should think about this with first the, the division between the two semesters and then all the projects are just impressive. The set of tools, the set of approaches, everything is just fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for the lovely presentations. Thank you. And Professor Shopman would like to compliment everybody too on their presentations. OK, now. Uh, all right, that concludes our session. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Sackham and Professor Minamare and if he likes Professor Chang to hang around for a minute. Everybody else, uh, we need to talk more or less privately, so. I would have, uh, uh, Burke, you're welcome to stay. Everybody else should be.